Thank you, Steve. First, a note of history. The check became a symbolic check <laughs> the year after an awardee left it behind on the lectern. <laughs> Three thoughts to start with as we honor our event. The first is from Norman Cousins in 1977 when he said, the real gift the United States has given the world in 200 years is the idea that it's possible to plan a rational future. Arvin does that. The second from William Penn, who said, helping to heal the world is true religion. And the third from a man who went to a fortune teller and was told you will be very, very poor and very unhappy until you're 45. And the man grasped that straw and he asked, what will happen when I'm 45? And the fortune teller said, you're gonna get used to it. <laughs> what Aravind tells us is we can't allow the world to get used to it illness and starvation and thirst and poverty. I don't know for sure why you're here tonight, but I can make some assumptions. The first is that you're not a cross-section of the United States. Your goodwill, your optimism, your empowerment, your vision are above average. Number two, you've prospered beyond what most people can expect, and therefore you control more resources than the average person. Number three, you've learned from Mark Twain that the person who does not read good books has no advantage over the person who can't read at all. And so you've learned that the person that does not use resources well has no advantage over the person who lacks resources. And you've already faced up to the fact that you're going to control these resources for only a short time. Life is short. Five, you're not fatalists or you wouldn't be here tonight. You actually think you can change your future and the future of other people and you think that because you've experienced it. And number six, like many of us, you're probably a control freak. <laughs> and you're wanting to control those resources even after you're gone. <laughs> but let me go even further. Those are pretty certain, but let me add three more things that will apply to many people here, maybe most people here. Some of you are already convinced that the measure of civilization is not found in the GNP or in knowledge or in technology or even in happiness. The metric for civilization is as simple as how people treat each other. And number two, many of you have gone beyond the obvious geographic implications on how you treat people across the city, across the state, across the nation, across the world, to time. How you treat people who have not yet been born, who you will never see. And third, therefore, some of you See that your real bosses include everyone who will be born in the future because you're involved in preparing the world they're going to live in. And for those of you in that category, you came to the right place this week. Arvin, for the fact that they are leading us in this conversation we have with the future generations. You've heard everything now about how this started. I like the idea that Dr. Govindapa Venkata Swami was then Dr. V. It's part of their efficiency drive. <laughs> but then when you see how this entire family became involved and how their vision was to provide vision, first to individuals, then to an entire country. 
Gandhi said people often become what they believe themselves to be, and Arvind believed itself to be the vision for India. The ripples of benefit continue to go out uncounted now, and they will because they know how to treat each other. And when you see what Dr. Nam has done to continue the growth of this organization, I mean, it's unbelievable that they see millions of people a year do hundreds of thousands of surgeries, and 70% of them at no or low cost. So they teach us about how to treat others, but they also teach us something about globalization. I'm reminded of when Martin Luther King talked about the debt he owed to Gandhi and how Gandhi, in turn, talked about the debt that he owed to Thoreau. This idea of philosophies and beliefs ping-ponging back and forth between cultures. And in a similar way, eye surgeons in the United States now thank Arvind for the fact that they get lenses much cheaper, while Arvind, in turn, thanks McDonald's. I mean, think of this. <laughs> and there's something very inspiring about Dr. Nam having been a professor at the Abraham Lincoln Medical School. It reminds me of Democritus, who 2,400 years ago said, the home of a great soul is the whole world. Einstein put it in a different way when he said nationalism is an infantile disease. He said it's the measles of mankind. And one lesson from us to take from all of this is we are preparing the world that people will live in. The opportunities are legion, and we have learned this week that compassion and caring is not outdated. Some other lessons. Kierkegaard, the great Danish theologian and philosopher, once told a story about a man who broke into a jewelry store and stole nothing. All he did was rearrange all the price tags. We live in a world where the price tags have been rearranged. And so we put the highest value on athletes and financial advisors, but not on nurses, not on teachers, not on mental health workers. And we put a low price tag on equity. Arvind has put a high price tag on equity and on vision. Schweitzer, in talking to students, once said, I don't know what you're going to do in the future, but what I do know those of you who are happy will be the ones who have learned how to serve. Third, creativity requires pulling ideas from every place. And then you end up with this unexpected thing that we've talked about, this vision of India experiencing improvement in sight because of McDonald's. And I'm starting to sound like a Big Mac commercial, but <laughs> There's something surreal about this, and you wonder, did I hear correctly? <laughs> and it reminds me of a public health colleague who told me years ago about his roommate in college who was from Australia and was often asked to talk about Australia, which he did to Kiwanis clubs and so forth. And one day he was talking to a Baptist church group. And at the end of his talk, a man stood up and asked, are there many Baptists in Australia? The speaker had heard this question so often that in his mind what he heard, are there many rabbits in Australia? <laughs> and he said, good Lord, they're the national nuisance. <laughs> he said, we hunt them and shoot them and poison them. but they just keep reproducing. <laughs> A fourth lesson that we've learned, coalitions. Some of you will remember, you saw Dr. Ajeta today. He was once on the national basketball team for Ethiopia. 
So I told him tonight, I'm going to tell a basketball story. Some of you remember when Stacy King was a rookie for the Chicago Bulls, and one night, he had a disastrous night, he made one point. It was the same night that Michael Jordan made 69 points. And as Stacy King was trying to get to the dressing room without being caught, a reporter grabs him and asks him, how did you feel about the game tonight? And Stacy King said, I'll always remember this as the night that I teamed up with Michael Jordan for, 20, for 70 points. <laughs> so that's what coalitions are about. And Gandhi said, we should spend as much time learning about interdependence as we do on self-reliance, because he said there is no other way. Our accomplishments are because of coalitions. And we heard today about leadership at the luncheon uh, session and how leadership today is not found in a title, it's found in the person that successfully makes a coalition work. Arvind is a, an example of a coalition that keeps enlarging and now includes the Hilton Foundation and now includes everyone in this room that figures they want to somehow participate. Coalitions are getting more complicated but it's a coalition of Harvard University, the Merck Drug Company, the Gates Foundation, the government of Botswana, and dozens of small NGOs and church groups in Botswana that has brought the HIV positivity rate of newborns in Botswana from 40% to 4% in less than a decade. I mean, it's incredible. It is living proof. Standing together brings strength and hope and change. I visited a hospital in Botswana 10 years ago before people were talking openly about AIDS. They called AIDS a radio disease that they heard about on the radio, but no one used the word in talking. I made rounds at a hospital where perhaps 90% of the patients we saw had AIDS. The word was never used. They talked about tuberculosis and cancer and other things that were causing these people to die. We went to a room afterwards and I asked the medical officer in charge, how do you maintain your mental health? How do you get up and come in every day? He sat and stared at me until I regretted having asked the question. And then suddenly tears came down his face. And he said, surrounded by his staff and visitors, I'm going to tell you something I've never told anyone before. He said, I was born one of four sons. My three brothers have died of AIDS and I have no choice. We have choices and the opportunity to exercise them wisely. The final example I'm going to use. We heard at noon today about education in Ghana and the importance of looking forward rather than memorizing which is looking backwards. This year there was a contest for student entrepreneurs and there was a dinner in Seattle as people from around the world came in that had won regional uh, contests. The winners turned out to be two Ghanaian students. They took the problem of adulterated drugs. Some people think a third of all the drugs in Africa are probably adulterated. And they asked, how do you use cell phones to change that? And they suggested, just as with Lotto, you scratch off something that gives you a number, put that on every vial of medication, you scratch it off, you dial a number on your cell phone, enter those numbers, and you immediately find out whether this is adulterated or whether it's good. It's such a simple solution. Students from Ghana. A tsunami killed 200,000 people, and it got our attention. An earthquake killed 200,000 people, and it got our attention. But what's the rest of the story? We heard from Jeff at the first session this morning that we lose 200,000 children under the age of five from preventable causes every eight days. 
and it doesn't get our attention. My point, you don't have to look far to find worthy projects, things that need doing, choices to be made, places where we can become the voice for the poor and the disadvantaged. My last point, the book The Lucifer Effect talks about this experiment at Stanford that we've all heard about where students became guards or prisoners and both groups were corrupted within days. The teacher was the warden and the teacher became corrupted. And now he wrote this book finally, What Are the Lessons We've Learned? And he goes to the positions of power, whether it be between Catholic priests and children, whether it be guards in a prison in Iraq, whether it be American soldiers in Vietnam, whether it be our elected officials who do not want to lose power at the next election. And he said, we're always looking for the bad apples without acknowledging that the real problem is a bad barrel. And when 200,000 children die every eight days from preventable causes, this is a bad barrel. But then we learn at the end of the book that it is possible, because there are plenty of examples, of leaders to provide good barrels where average people perform better than average consistently. The Hilton Foundation seeks out such examples for their humanitarian prize of good barrels where average people perform better than average consistently. And our event is an example of a good barrel. It's a, an example for us not to just em, to honor, but to emulate. This room is full of people who have demonstrated their ability to lead and create all kinds of companies and products. So we do honor to Arvin if we don't simply honor them, but emulate them and go out and make more good barrels. AIDS in Botswana, smallpox eradication, Arvin all remind us that coordinated action by people can, up, can provide for a rational future. This does not have to be a world of blindness and plagues and disastrous governments and conflict and uncontrolled health risks. And we should settle for nothing less. We should settle for nothing less. Thank you.